Sweet Jesus, thank you for this time in this room. And thank you for your Holy Spirit. We, uh, we need his interruption tonight and we need his influence. And we love, we love being here with you and settling into you. Just open our hearts to you tonight. In your sweet name we pray, amen. So the 11th step goes like this. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for the knowledge of his will for us. It's huge. Only praying for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. So I was just asking somebody um, in the church that you go to, you're gonna go to this Sunday. Out of 100 people, how many people do you think have a conscious contact with God? I mean, I'm not talking about trying to be a learner of stuff it says in the Bible, which is great, but how many people have a conscious contact with God where they literally can talk to you about what it's like in their life to walk around with Jesus? And they're like, they can, they can have that kind of, a, kind of a conversation, right? And it's not awkward for them. It's not weird. They're like wide open to being able to talk about that. How many people have that gift? And this program of recovery provides us with that gift as an essential, right? It provides us with that gift as an essential. Again, more and more I keep looking at the importance of, and I wish, I wish, We'll save it for next year, but I wish that I would have worked harder in the first part of this stuff on the steps, talking about why did they pick those four basic pieces of recovery as essential above anything else? Like, and we've talked about it. The first one was powerlessness. Second one was um, being able to, being able to um, deal with the men's. The third one was conscious contact with God. And the fourth one was service. And like, Man, that is a very big deal. And the fact that one of them we're hitting on tonight is key. You know, what, what you would believe to be true in this program of recovery with these 12 steps is, is that once we have gotten to the place of the 11th step, we have worked our way through our resentments toward God, right? Our disappointments toward God, our being on the run from God, our being unavailable to God, are believing that we are God, right? That we're a better God than God. We have hopefully worked our way through all of those steps, the, the fear of being unacceptable to God, the fear of not being worthy of being with God, the fear of God not loving me. We would have worked, we will have worked through all of that, all of that life challenge in order to get to this step. And so now we seek through prayer and medication Prayer and medication, that's right. That's good. That's what we do. There is what we do. I just, you know what? I just tied clay. I just tied clay for one of his steps several years ago. Prayer and medication, yeah. That's what, you can go home and say, I went to this really good program at this church. And this is what they said. And like... I would have to back you up. Anyway, prayer and meditation, we've gotten to the point of where this step, now we're ready for this step and we're ready for all the gifts, all the gifts that it's gonna bring to us to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for the knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. We ask especially, the big book says, for freedom from self-will in this step and are careful to make no request for ourselves only. How much is it true that the vast majority of us were, learned to, were, were people that learned to pray by what is called um, petition or intercession only, right? You, you grew up learning that if you needed to, if you wanted to have a, you know, do better with the test, if you wanted to improve, have this change in your life, if you wanted to get a job, if you wanted to get better grades, if you wanted to do something that you wanted, you would go to God, right? And you would ask God 
for the opportunity for that to happen, right? You would ask for that. And there's really, there's really nothing, I mean, is there something wrong with intercession? There is not. But what we're talking about tonight is something very different. It's almost like the intercession, it's almost like the, the experience of intercession of asking God, look, I need, for my, I need for this person in my life to get better. I need for my marriage to improve. I need for one of my kids to be safe. I need for this person to be sober. It's almost like now in this step, God is doing the intercession with us, right? Like he's talking to you about, I wanna talk to you about this in your life because now you're following my will, right? So now now the tables are turned and I'm interceding for you. Are you following that? I'm interceding, God's like, for you. I'm gonna like speak into you. You're not coming to, you know, you're not coming to sit down and be in front of me and asking me for all these things that you need. I'm coming to you and telling you, this is how I know you, right? And this is how I want to now begin to move into your life and begin to, and begin to speak truth and freedom into you. We make no requests for ourselves only. We may ask for ourselves, however, if others will be helped. Interesting. We may ask for help for ourselves if others would be helped through it. We are careful to never pray for our own selfish ends. And so the Walmart relationship with God of going, look, here's my list. The Santa list isn't there. We're into a different kind of a relationship with God in this 11th step. As we go through the day, we pause when agitated or doubtful and ask for the right thought or the right action. We constantly remind ourselves we are no longer running the show. Humbly saying to ourselves many times every day, thy will be done. We are then in much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, or foolish decisions. We become much more efficient. We do not tire so easily from anxiety. For we are not burning up energy foolishly as we did when we were trying to arrange life to suit ourselves. Anybody ever heard of that? You know? Is, tell me about the anxiety we experience as a result of that. Like, I can't get my life to do what I think it ought to do, right? I can't get my boyfriend to do what I think he ought to do. I can't get my girlfriend to do what I think she ought to do. I can't get my boss to do what I think they ought to do. I can't get this company to do what I think it ought to do. I can't get my friend to do what I think they ought to do. I can't get my sister or brother, I can't get my sibling to do what it is I think they ought to do. Man, and it's driving me crazy. And in the 87th page of the big book, we're being given this solution that for, in a lot of cases, we probably don't even really want. The step 11 prayer comes in um, really in four parts. First part is, God direct my thinking, especially that it be divorced. This is interesting. That it be divorced, my thinking be divorced from self-pity, dishonesty or self-seeking motives. Number two, God, give me an inspiration, an intuitive thought or decision. God, give me an inspiration. Give me a, a view that I, don't, that I don't have for myself tonight. Give me a view. An inspiration, intuitive thought, or a decision. Number three, God, show me all throughout my day what my next step is going to be. Give me whatever I need to take care of any problems. I ask especially for freedom from self-will. This will thing must be a big deal. You know, it must be a big deal. You see it in the thread, don't you? You see the progression of this. Step one talks about powerlessness. You know, I really don't know if I really believe that, you say to yourself, but okay, then step two says, the life you're living right now, because you actually still believe you are all, all powerful, that right there is insanity, and you're not gonna be able to correct the insanity in your life. It's gonna take someone greater than you to be able to do it. And then step three says, I made a decision to turn my life and my will over to the care of God as I understand God, right? 
And now in step 11, as a result of me making that decision in steps one, two, and three, and as a result of me clearing the decks in the steps previous to step 11, and as a result of me working on my resentments, and as a result of me working on my jealousy, and as a result of me working on my anger, which comes from my hurt, and as a result of me working on what's hurting me, and as a result of me working on my disappointment, I get to this place where I really do believe that it would be much healthier for me to seek God's will for me in my life over and against going to God, which is the way it has been for, it's for most of us, has been anyway until you get into a program like this, which is so wildly different. You are basically taught in your prayer life, are you not, to go to God with stuff that you want and need in your life. And this says, God's gonna come to you with what he needs from you. God's gonna come in and talk to you about, I wanna show you how to really grow right here. Right, I wanna show you what I wanna do, what I wanna do with your life. You know, I wanna show you. And what is it like when God shows his will to us? Most of us, because we're pretty good consumers and we're Americans, we kinda go, yeah, well, I mean, I'll just, I mean, God can present me his will any way he wants to. You know, but I mean, like, thing is, I'll, I'll be the judge of, I mean, I'll be the judge of uh, how we're really gonna do that. I mean, if I think God's idea is crazy, I'm not gonna do it. It's like one of the most important books I ever read, um, and I've talked about it before, is this book called Experiencing God. It's written by a guy, Henry Blackaby. Henry Blackaby is a, don't, don't look up Henry Blackaby on YouTube and start listening to his sermons. They're deadly. Like, he's, he's not a great in-person communicator. He's an unbelievably gifted writer. And Blackaby talks about, you know, when you begin, when you begin to go to the place, it's exactly what the step is talking about. You begin to go to the place where God is working and you seek to join God in God's work and you change your thinking and go, I'm gonna stop having God come to where I'm working and facilitate what I wanna do and I'm gonna go to where God is working and I'm gonna do what God wants to do. I got, it's just radical. And, and that book talks about seven or eight different things that are gonna happen to you when you begin to, when you begin to only pray for God's will. And it's like, for first thing that's gonna happen to you is you gotta realize that you're gonna go through a crisis of faith, life, and belief. Like, you're gonna get jumbled up when you start to pray like this. You're gonna realize that God is gonna provide you with all the resources necessary in order for you to be able to do what it is he's trying to accomplish in his work. He is gonna invite you, deliberately you personally, and that's what this step talks about. He's gonna invite you personally to join him in his work. It's not an accident that after we work on this 11th step, the 12th step talks about, I'm gonna go carry this message to others. I'm gonna go learn how to serve other people. It's not an accident that the service part of this program of recovery is also one of the four majors that originally started off these steps. Whew. God, show me all throughout my day what my next step is to be. It's black of me exactly. Give me whatever I need to take care of any problems. I ask especially for freedom from self-will and then thy will be done. The 11th step promise is really, really cool. This is what it says. You know, like if I said to you, have you ever had, have you ever had a hunch about something? Most of you would raise your hands, right? Somewhere along your life, you're gonna have a hunch. You're gonna have a hunch about somebody's personality. You're gonna have a hunch about where you're going, being good or bad. You're gonna have a hunch about a lot of things that you're gonna just have a gut feeling of whether something's you know, really gonna work or whether you're comfortable with A, B, or C, or whatever. So we know about hunches. You know, where it says, we used to be, what used to be the hunch or the occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. So like, 
that, that experience where in a random way, in a random place, at what appears to be a random time, God intervenes in your life. Like, have you ever had that happen where you say to yourself, I can't explain how this happened except people go, it, just, it must be God. Or people are gonna say, it must be a God thing. Like you've heard that phrase, right? Like, and it's, you, you're like, I don't know if I'll ever be able to replicate that again. It's like this is a one-shot deal where God literally showed his face to me or God literally showed me something about me or my life or the world or life or whatever. And like, I don't, I don't know if I'll ever see it again. And this step says, oh yeah, oh yeah. What used to become hunch or inspir- an inspirational event now becomes a working part of the way you think. Like when you get into this conscious contact with God and you're walking around with Jesus and you're learning how to listen and you're learning how to follow and you're learning how to let him take the lead in the dance of life, man, it's gonna be a very big deal because what used to be a random hunch or what used to be a random experience that you just, you just had this experience with God that you never had before. Now this step is saying, we can show you how to have this on the reg. We can show you how to have this on the reg. Like back to that book, Experiencing God, if you read it, the whole first, there are stories in that book that are gonna blow you away. Like there is stuff in there, stuff this guy did um, in his ministry and stuff that, you, you'd be like, that was just idiotic that you would go there. I mean, remember that when he went to, was it Alaska he went to to start that mission or somewhere? Somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. And he, they sent him out there with like, they challenged him to go out there and start this church. And he goes out there with $200. And he's like, I went through the first to $200 in like a day. And then I'm like sitting there with my kids and my wife and everything going, I don't have any people here. I don't have any money. I'm out here with my family. The church, the church body paid for me to move out here. And here we are. <laughs> you know, and, and that's like, that's that principle. If God's gonna lead you there and God's will is gonna take you there, then God is gonna provide what you need to do what God is asking you to do there. You know, like there are stories in the Bible that lift this up. There's like, there are stories like, there's a story in the Bible, you can look it up, where there's like, there's like this fortress with, um, I don't know, thousands and thousands of well-equipped warriors. And so God, he has this ragtag band of, of uh, semi-retired soldiers you know, like kids, people that have no idea, have no idea how to fight. No one's a trained soldier. And there they are standing outside of the walls of this town, Jericho. And God goes, we're gonna, um, this is my will. We're gonna take that city. <laughs> you're like, if you're in your right mind, if you're trying to be logical, if you're following the will of survival, you run, don't you? You run. It's like, it's like how, many people, how many people at first blush? Most of, it's true that most of us begin developing a compulsion because we have a fear that we need to soothe some kind of a way, amen? amen. At one level or another. And it's true that at least for a while, what we pick our compulsion to be will soothe that pain, right? It will soothe that. That is true until it doesn't. But if somebody says to you, I wanna offer you this program of freedom, and I mean like really all you gotta do, it's pretty simple, all you gotta do is change everything about your life. Like you gotta change the way you spend your time. You gotta change people you're spending time with. You gotta have a sponsor, someone that's gonna listen to your stuff every day. You gotta like do this work on stuff like these steps. You know, you gotta do all that. You know, like, and if you do all that, if you do all that and you really begin to understand God's will for you, God's will for you is always that you have an abundant life and that you flourish. It is always that you have an abundant life and that you flourish. And when you get in touch with what God's will for you is, that God is always on your side, would never seek to defeat you, only wants to love you more deeply, and would never do anything to hurt you. 
this becomes very, very important. You know, this isn't, this isn't like an obedience issue. It's not like an obedience issue like you gotta do the right thing. It's like an opportunity issue of, are you, willing, are you really will, willing to listen to God's heart? Because like Blackaby, that's what he clearly is doing. Otherwise, he's insane. If you read the book, you're like, the dude, don't get the workbook, by the way. It is a killer, man. It'll take you four years, and you'll, you'll tell me you couldn't, you couldn't handle it. I know. This is forever. We get the book book. I'm telling you, get the book book, or get the audio book if you like those. But he began to understand the freedom of walking in, walking in the will of God. Walking in the will of God. The, it's, uh, you know, you, 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 get to these, you get to this truth when you see Jesus do his work. Go and read any of the four stories about Jesus in the second half of the Bible. Pick John, pick Luke, pick Mark, pick Matthew. If you wanna read the shortest one, well, pick Matthew. In my estimation, if you wanna read the best one, well, I'm unbelievably biased right here, but pick John, pick John every time, man. Every time, pick John. Just read that book. Read it for a year. Read it for a year. Just sit and read that book for a year. Anyway, you read one of those four stories about Jesus. What are you gonna see every time? Every time something big is about to happen to Jesus, you will find Jesus stepping away from everything and everybody around him. And it says he went over to pray. He went up into the hills. He went to be alone. And almost every time that Jesus is about to say something major, he will start off with, or frequently, he will start off with the word amen first. It's like, wait a minute, don't you say amen at the end? He did. Because like, what's happening to Jesus right then is he is finishing a conversation with his father, and then he's gonna begin to talk, talk to other people. You know, like, he absolutely, he absolutely doesn't do anything that his father doesn't tell him to do. When Jesus decides in his 30s that he's gonna, ta- he's gonna become publicly available and do his work in public ministry, the first thing he does is he goes off to be in the wilderness. He goes out there to encounter his father. He also obviously is gonna encounter the enemy, just like us. But in the encounter with the enemy, he pays attention to what the enemy is saying, but he only listens to and follows the words of the Father. Are you following that? Because why is that? Because he has conscious contact with his Father. He knows the difference of of the voice of his Father and the voice of the enemy, the voice of the liar. Do we, like most of what makes us sick spiritually is that we confuse what the enemy is saying to us and what God is saying to us because we don't have enough familiarity with what it's like when God is speaking to us. Like, can you tell the difference? Can you tell the difference of when God is talking to you and the enemy is talking to you. If you are in this step enough and you're willing to walk with Jesus enough and you're willing to be open to what God is trying to do with you enough, you're gonna be able to answer yes to that eventually. You're gonna be like, yeah, I can tell the difference. Like, I can tell the difference. I can tell the difference because when God is speaking to Mark Beebe, he's not increasing my anxiety, he's decreasing it. I can tell the difference because God is not decreasing my sense of value about me. He's increasing it. Enemy's doing the opposite. I can tell the difference because life doesn't feel like it's closing in when I'm talking to God. Life feels like it's opening up. When the enemy is talking to me, life is definitely closing in. When I'm talking to God, God is saying, I want you to take me by the hand and I'm gonna show you where you're gonna go. And the enemy is gonna say to me, Mark, I don't know what you're gonna do. This is a hell of a mess here. This is really gonna be hard for you. You're probably gonna fail at this. You should probably quit right now. And by the way, do you really think that God is all that worthy of all this attention you're giving him? That's what the enemy says to you. The enemy creates doubt in us about ourselves, doubt about our intentions, doubt about our abilities, 
doubt about our value, doubt about our worthiness, doubt about our, our ability to forgive other people, doubt, doubt about whether or not God has forgiven us, doubt about whether the shame we've carried around, if we're really free from it actually, or if something was really our fault. That's what the enemy does. And in this step, the key piece of what's gonna happen is you're gonna learn how to hear the voice of God. You're gonna learn how to hear the voice of Jesus because you're paying enough attention all the time to what he's saying to you. When Jesus goes out in the wilderness, it was all about relationship. If you notice when he's, it's in the fourth chapter of uh, the book Luke, second half of the Bible. You will see in that book, in the fourth chapter, where it's talking about Jesus being in the wilderness. He doesn't, there's no, re, there's no accounting of what they talk about, he and his father out in the wilderness. It isn't like, well, in those time, in that time, that 40 days that Jesus was out there, God gave them all the marching orders for what was gonna happen in the next three years. For all I know, they were talking about soccer. You know, I don't know what they were talking about, but there, there's no indication that they were doing, they were doing like, ex, you know, executing planning or creating a vision statement or anything else. I mean, like every church in America spends 200,000 years trying to create a vision statement. What would happen if you said, forget all that, we're gonna come here on Sunday night, we're gonna sit down for 45 minutes, we're gonna fill this room with people from church, we're gonna pray, we're gonna pray for the Holy Spirit to be showered over this church, we're gonna pray for evidence of Jesus in people's lives, we're gonna pray for the next thousand people to be one in this building, 500 people to be baptized, we're gonna do all that. We're not gonna, there already is a freaking mission statement, we just don't wanna follow it. It's already sitting right there. It's like, can you imagine God going, I put one right in there in the second chapter of Acts. What are you, what are you, arrogant? You think you can do better than me? You're gonna do one better when I already gave you the operator's manual for the church? What's the matter with you? What's the matter with us is we like our will better. We like our will better. We like our voice better. We like our plan better. And this step says, all that's gonna go because you're gonna build a relationship with God. By doing this together, you're gonna build a relationship with Jesus that is so strong and so comfortable, after a while, you're not gonna know how, you're not gonna know how to get into something in your life where you're, you're not gonna already have brought him into it. Amen? You're not... You're so comfortable with that kind of a relationship with Jesus, of just walking around with him, you're not gonna know it any other way. It's like, I used to have the biggest problem um, with this step and the whole word of, um, you know, the whole word of meditation, because like, the only way I knew meditation was like Eastern, like an Eastern style of meditation where, you know, you're, you know, you're focusing on a word, you're in silence, you know, you're all alone, all that's going on. It's like, man, I, I cannot, I can't pull that off. Like it'll, just, I can't pull that off. I, I, but, but then I learned from people like, like a guy, like a, another guy, like a lot. Richard Rohr is his name. He wrote this book, Breathing Underwater. I learned from Richard Rohr that, man, that is only one style of being alone with God or being in conscious contact with God. There's another, there's plenty of other styles. One style is while you're driving around in your car, you're just fully aware of this conversation you're having with Jesus. You're cutting the grass, you're doing whatever. You're just fully aware of walking around with Jesus. You're fully aware. You know, when you're, when you're doing whatever it is you're doing, you're fully aware of what it's like to be with Jesus. I know Jesus so well, so well, you say, that I trust his outcome over any other outcome that I can imagine. You know, like, we're very good at saying the polite thing, right? Which goes right to the step. Here's what people say. When they have no other way to go with something and they feel like things are totally jacked up and they've ran, run out of any other ideas on their own, only by default do we say, well, I put it in God's hands. Can you not imagine God? Well, now you're ready. We've been on this for six months. Now you're ready. Let me 
now. Like after all this, look at all this pain. Look at all of this that happened. Now you're ready. Thank God he doesn't say, he doesn't say that like that. that probably, that's why I'm not God. That's why you're not either. Six months of hell, and we get to the place of going, well, I've tried all my, all my tries. I'm gonna put it, in, I'm putting it, I'm laying this into God's hands. And my question is, are you? Because if I gave you a way out of this that you could do on your own, would you take it? Or would you sit here and allow God to lead you maybe to where you don't wanna go? Do I trust Jesus so much that I trust his outcome, his outcome over anything that I can imagine? It's kind of like you first get started in recovery. And if it's drugs or alcohol, someone might be talking to you about well, maybe it'd really be helpful for you to think about treatment somewhere. And here we go. You're a million miles away from this step at that point, right? And I would expect you to be, because you're gonna be going, well, how long do I have to be there? How much is it gonna cost? What are they gonna do when I get there? What are the living arrangements gonna be like? What if I wanna leave? What if I don't like it? What are they gonna say? Do you really think it's gonna work? Like, I'm, you're gonna get this barrage of questions, you know, when like a good salesperson's gonna go, well, no, here's the answers to all those questions, right? As opposed to going, you know what? I don't know what any of that's gonna be like. All I know is, all I know is, if Jesus is urging you to get help this way, just do it. Stop asking questions. If in this program, someone is saying to you, get a sponsor, do it. Stop going, well, I just don't know. I mean, I don't know if I can call somebody every day. Oh my God, I don't know if I can go to a meeting every day. If someone says, go to a meeting every day and you're gonna get free and that's what God wants for you, it must be good. Do it, amen? Just do it. Just stop obsessing with, should I, shouldn't I? What do I think? What do I not think? What's my personal opinion? And the whole thing is, it goes completely opposite of what this step teaches us. Do you trust that Jesus wants more for you tonight than you want for you? Do you trust that his outcome for you is more worthy than yours is? Jesus says it like this. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Those who remain in me, this is step 11, and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I, I improve and increase and seek a conscious contact, a hand-to-hand, -hand, a face-to-face -face relationship with Jesus. I'm not really looking for religion. I'm looking to walk with Jesus. Amen? Amen. Sweet Jesus, thank you for everybody in this room, Lord, and for the opportunity for freedom to be here. We love you. Your words just um, take our breath away sometimes. And at least for me, tonight's one of those nights. In your sweet name, amen.